Good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. We have a talented organ, do we not? It plays by itself. I was just thinking, you know, Carol's away this weekend and uh, she has everything pre recorded. And uh, so it's, uh, we're testing that out today. I was thinking, I wonder if I could kind of do that, just kind of record my message and maybe put like a little poster up or something. And uh, no, all right, wouldn't work. All right, well, it's good to be with you today. Uh, God is good. Uh, this Saturday begins spring. Yay, uh, I'm ready for some spring. We see signs of new life all over already. And God is working. And, uh, you know, I'm just thinking today is the one-year anniversary. March 15th uh, was the last Sunday that we met in person a year ago without mask or social distancing. And so here we are a year later. We're a little further along than we were, still wearing masks and still social distancing. But I'm hoping by the second anniversary that uh, we'll be back to some sort of normalcy. And uh, I know Jim had mentioned that today was the second anniversary of Linwood Henry's passing. I, I really miss Linwood. He was a good guy and had wonderful stories. And so we, uh, we know that he is in eternity, and uh, we just thank God for his goodness and grace and all that's ours in Christ Jesus. Well, it's good to be here. Uh, just some announcements. Um, it's Wednesday at 7 p.m. We have our Lenten service. Uh, it's on Psalm 145, 8 through 19, God is rich in love. And uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, uh, they need help with the Mifflin Community Food Ministry food distribution, which will take place on Saturday. Uh, if you're able to lend some time, I know Deb and, and Pauline and others would be grateful for that. Um, the altar flowers are presented to the glory of God in memory of my mother, Pauline Musser, by Sandy and Phil Lenhart. And yes, I, I remember my visits uh, with Pauline, and uh, she was a sweet, sweet lady who, who loved the Lord. And Whenever I would talk about prayer of the church, she would just light up. And, and so praise God uh, that he has compassion for us through his son. Uh, the bulletins is presented to the glory of God in memory of Ron and Shirley Berger by Lori Berger. Um, April newsletter deadline is next Sunday, March 21st. Uh, there's information in your bulletin about pantry needs, uh, self-denial offering taken during March. Uh, there's also a, an order form for Easter lilies, if you'd like to help decorate the sanctuary for Easter. Uh, these will be taken until March 28th. You can give these to uh, Rosalie or to Becky. Um, let's see here. A simple kindness makes a normal day extraordinary. Thank you for all the, the get well uh, and symphony cards uh, I received from fellow members and friends of Zion. They're greatly appreciated, Nancy Geis. I hear Nancy is doing a little bit better. They're working on getting her sodium levels to where they need to be. She might be able to come home from the hospital today. Um, I talked to Cindy Kern, and, and Bob is making some progress. Cindy's still recovering from COVID and making some progress. And uh, we, we just thank God that he brings healing in so many different ways. And, uh, and I know it's a difficult time for many, and yet we know that God's with us, and he's providing all that we need. We just need to continue to keep our, our focus on Christ Jesus. Um, Cindy says, thank you for all the prayers and cards during her illness, and uh, congratulations to Kaylin Brendel on her cheerleading squad from Daniel Boone High School. They are county champs for their division. Way to go, girls, and so congratulations to Kaylin. Um, with that, we have our uh, call to worship. I will read the, the light print. You can respond with the bold. Once you lived in darkness. Find what is pleasing to God and follow God's ways. Thanks be to God who gives us light. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we come together today. We ask that you would surround us in your care as only you can. Uh, we pray that you would just pour out your Holy Spirit upon us as we worship this day. We uh, uh, lift this uh, service into your care. May it be pleasing in your sight, for we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our opening hymn is, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Please stand and join me. Fount of every blessing 
Reach in my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise his name, I fixed upon it, name of God's redeeming love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place. And I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. From to water, Lord, I feel it, from to leave a God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. I'm not sure, but I think we set a Guinness Book of World Records for the fastest singing of Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Um, I, I'm not sure if we can turn that tempo down at this point, but we need to maybe talk to Alan Organ next time on how we can tweak that just a little bit to turn the tempo down. You may be seated. Uh, it just keeps life interesting. Carol would love this, yeah, so make sure you flood her with calls and emails and letting her know. <laughs> I've been telling Carol for a while she needs to play a little faster, so maybe she did this on purpose. Um, so, I, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Anyway, it's great to be here. Uh, Phyllis and I were able to go to Maryland yesterday. We spent the day with uh, Rob and Michelle and our, our, our grandson, Nathan. It was a great day. Sandy came along. And uh, by the time we got home, we were exhausted, including Sandy. And I, and I thought to Phyllis, I said, you know, the next time we make the trip to Maryland to see young grandchildren, I said, make sure it's on a day that we're not springing forward. You know, it just, it just seems like, wow. Uh, but it was a great time to see little Nathan. He's just growing so quickly. And uh, it's just amazing, God's precious gift. I, I just uh, thank God for our children and grandchildren and for his uh, amazing love. I thank you for all that you do for God's church here at Zion. Let me pray with you. Father God, we come together today and we thank you uh, for those that faithfully give time, talent, and treasure. We pray that you would bless the gift and the giver as we continue to lift up the name of Jesus in a world that's lost in sin to a people in desperate need of a Savior. It's in our Savior's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Oh. It's new. You know, it's just one of those days you're just going to have to go with it, guys. <laughs> oh, my. It reminds me of a children's message uh, years ago in Ohio where 
I was talking to the children about what they needed to do to prepare to, to go to church. And uh, one of the little girls said, well, you need to make sure you put clothes on or you'd be naked. And it just caught me. And I thought, you know, that's good advice. It really is. You know, we, we should make sure that we come to church with clothes on and uh, just trusting God that he's going to bless our time together. Oh. So I, I said, you know, uh, Cindy and, and Bob, uh, we need to continue to pray for, we need to continue to pray for Nancy Geis, uh, for those that are uh, recovering from surgeries. Uh, we've got Joy Heckman on the list there as well. Uh, Bill and Ethel Hughes, we haven't seen in, in a little while, and, and yet I know they're still struggling with just uh, all the challenges that come as we get older. Uh, Marty Redke is home, and I'm sure Rosalie is taking good care of him. And uh, on the men, little by little. And so we just, we thank God that he, uh, he meets us in our time of need. Emerald Wall, her surgery went well. Um, she's on the men. They're still waiting to kind of hear about uh, what they're going to do with the liver. But uh, little by little, uh, she's coming along, says grandma and grandpa. And so we, uh, we thank God for his healing touch upon her life. We, uh, we thank God that no matter what we face, that we're not facing it alone, that he is indeed with us every step of the way, and he's only a prayer away. And, you know, I think sometimes it's so hard when we, we see a loved one suffering or we're mourning a loved one, and, you know, we, we want things to be immediate with God. I know with Phyllis, a lot of times I kind of pray, Lord, please, you know, take this uh, away from her and, and make her well. And yet I know that God's timing is perfect and he's doing things perhaps behind the scenes that we can't even fully understand on this side of eternity. But working he is and he has demonstrated that he loves us by sending his son into the world so that we can have life and life abundant. All of our needs met wonderfully each and every day in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, we come together today. We pray for those upon the, the prayer list, those that we've spoken about, and those that are on our hearts and our minds. We pray, Father, for those that are mourning loved ones, that you would be with them in their time of mourning, that you would give them the assurance of life eternal through your son Jesus, that you would fill them with precious memories of their loved ones' life. We pray, Father, for those that are in the hospitals and the nursing centers, that you would be with them and meet all of their needs. We pray for our shut-ins and those that aren't able to be here at church. We lift them into your care. We pray for our missionaries and the missions that we support throughout the world. We pray, Father, that you would be with us as we uh, reflect on this uh, one-year anniversary of dealing with a COVID pandemic, what was going to be originally two weeks. We Pray, Father, that you would continue to surround us in your care, that you would give us courage and strength and healing and hope as we move forward in faith, trusting that you are working out all the details of our lives. We pray, Father, for healing of the world, that others may begin to resume normal lifestyles, that families can gather and have hugs and kisses and just these social gatherings that we long for, that we miss. And so, Father, we just uh, lift this into your care. We pray that you would just provide everything that we need in Christ, that you would uh, give us the desire to seek you and serve you and love you and proclaim you each and every day. We pray, Father, for our military men and women throughout the world. We pray for our country, that you would bring healing to a country that's divided. We pray that you would be with our leaders, uh, local and national, that you would help them to seek you for wisdom, that they would put your precepts in place as they make decisions that impact uh, our country and so our, our very lives each and every day. We pray, Father, for renewal in our communities, in our schools, our workplaces, and in our homes that people would come to Jesus as Savior and Lord, the very same Jesus that taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Already, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Our uh, praise him is, what wondrous love is this? What wondrous love is this, oh my soul, oh my soul? 
That tempo was a little better, you know, working out. It's just amazing technology. I, I'm very grateful uh, to Doug uh, Sewell, who is doing the remote today and uh, playing the music as we go along. And so, you know, God is good. I, I know uh, Carol and Glenn had some business to attend to in Delaware. So I hope they're enjoying their, their time away. Um, you know, as we uh, come to our, our message today, it occurred to me when I was looking at the, the scripture reading, it's John 3, 14 to 21. Today happens to be March, which is the third month on the 14th day of the 21st year. Three, four, it's just a coincidence maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but uh, that's part of the lectionary readings for today. And it just struck me when I was looking at it the other day, I thought, that's the date, 3, 14, 21. So anyway, we're, we're here, we're going to talk about... Uh, the, the light of God, the living in his light, living in his love, and, and learning to, to love more like Jesus. And so we're going to take a look at that passage of Scripture in a little bit. But before we do, can I have somebody offer a prayer for the message today, please? Amen. I thank you, Bob. Um, you know, thinking about love, you know, what, what is love? You know, is it, is it a feeling? Uh, is it just simply an emotion? Or, or is love so much more? You know, I, I heard someone say once about, you know, do, do you love your family? And the expression was, well, I gave them milk. You know, I, I provided for their needs. And, and certainly that's... Uh, a measure of love. You know, we provide, you know, we care for one another in our love. But love is so much more than that. Love is not always easy and convenient. 
but love is required if we're going to have an intimate relationship one with the other. And uh, it, it's, you know, there's a uh, definition that I once read says, love is the attachment that results from deeply appreciating another's goodness. So lo love is a choice, it really is. We can choose to love. You know, too many people today, they base uh, love solely on an emotion or a feeling. And, and while that's the, the wonderful aspect of love, you know, that warm little fuzzies that we get, you know, it, that, that's certainly wonderful. But love is an intentionality. Love is, is, is so much more than just this emotion. It, it is the realization that because I love, I therefore work hard at uh, growing that relationship, maturing that relationship. And, and I know that it does, it, it is a process. You know, we think, if for those of you that are married, you know, we think about, uh, you know, what is love? You know, when I counsel uh, young adults uh, that are engaged and want to plan a, a wedding, uh, I, I do marriage counseling with them, and I'll say, you know, well, you know, how much do we put into to, to marriage? And a lot of times they'll say, well, marriage is 50-50. And I said, no, divorce is 50-50. Marriage is 100%. You know, we are to put our total effort each and every day into loving the other. We complete one another, and we need to make sure that we are working at showing in tangible ways that we, we truly love through good and through bad, through all times and seasons of life. And certainly, the, the ultimate total commitment of love, of giving selflessly, we can see this greatest love that we'll ever know, uh, the very love that comes from God through His Son, our Savior. And that is the epitome of true love, uh, the willingness to leave the throne room of heaven, to put on flesh and dwell among us, to live and to die a, a cruel death on a cross at Calvary, uh, to take away our sin, to give us the right to be children of God, and, and to know that love that is ours in, in Christ. How, how amazing is that? And it seems like God gave so much more than we've ever had to give, and, and yet God wants us to, to give our love and our devotion to him. Uh, we're to do that daily. You know, think about uh, uh, the relationships that we're in where we love one another. If we only spend about an hour a week working on that relationship, it probably wouldn't be a very good relationship. Uh, you know, we need to really every day be totally committed to loving and caring and providing uh, for those that we love, and that's what relationships are made of. Uh, the first part of our denominational mission statement is to know Christ. And I've spent a lifetime uh, trying to know Christ more, to, to love him more, and to, to make him known. And, and I, somehow I just feel like I'm still just scratching the surface. You know, I'm trying to be much more intentional about uh, you know, reaching out in love to God through prayer and through the study and application of his holy word but to, more importantly, to show that I love God, that this is not just him loving me through Christ, but that I love him by striving every day to, to be filled with the grace and love of Jesus. You know, we, we desperately need that. You know, Jesus said it's easy to love those that, that love you back. But boy, it takes a little bit of effort to, to love those that are outside of our inner circle. And, and yet, this is the depth of uh, God's love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. In the uh, first epistle of John, it says, Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. And so the key for us to understanding God's amazing love is to know his son, Christ Jesus, as Savior and Lord of your life. Uh, it, it is impossible for us to fully love God if we've not embraced Jesus as Savior and Lord. As a matter of fact, I, I, I know it's impossible to do. Uh, we, we can't love God unless we're able to connect with his son as Savior and Lord. So I want to spend some time this morning examining God's amazing love for us. Scripture says we love because he first loved us. And there are so many other passages of Scripture that declare God's love for us. God loves you perfectly, and he loved you perfectly even when you weren't aware of his love. You know, while we were still lost in sin, we were loved by God. As a matter of fact, before the, the creation of the world, before we were, 
God knew us and he loved us. And despite ourselves, he, he loves us. You know, I'm convinced that we can see from Scripture just how much God loves us. And uh, as a matter of fact, we know that God loves us this much because we are sinners. All have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And we know that it's the sin that separates us from God's love. And yet, while we were still sinners, God sent his son into the world to redeem lost mankind. And you know, the, the, real, the real challenge that we face is this, friends. Um, the grace of Jesus Christ has shed blood. That grace is sufficient for all of mankind, past, present, and future, until the Lord returns one day. But the problem is, it's not everybody receives this grace because they refuse the precious gift that is theirs in Christ Jesus. God gave us a free will. We can choose to receive his love and grace through his son, or we can reject it, and many do reject it today. You know, I was thinking uh, out loud with the 8 o'clock uh, service this morning that there are, there are many people in the world that take their dying breath without ever receiving Jesus as Savior and Lord, and they're, they're very defiant. Uh, they just don't feel that they need God. Or, you know, I hear people say, well, I believe in God. I just don't believe in Jesus. You know, the Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to God the Father. And, and I, I thought, you know, how, how terrible that is to spend an eternity separated from God because you refuse to allow the blood of Jesus to cover over your sin. You know, people say, well, how can a holy God send anybody to hell. And the truth is, God doesn't send anybody to hell. We decide. We decide through our free will whether to receive or to reject, and many reject even to their dying breath today. And it's the sin that separates us from God's love, and the only perfect offering to atone for that sin was the sinless Savior, His Son. So let's take a look at this, John three fourteen through 21. It says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Can't hide anything from God, can we? You know, certainly light uh, is uh, indicative to, to God's love and wholeness, and the dark is uh, indicative of sin, the sin that takes so many people away from God. I know my mother used to say, nothing good happens after midnight. Did your mother say that kind of stuff to you too? even though my curfew was long before midnight when she was saying that. So, but yeah, you know, people uh, do things in, in life that they may be ashamed of. And, uh, you know, God calls a lot of those things sin. And they try to hide it, uh, hide it from others, hide it from themselves sometimes. I know people living in denial. They're, they're lost in habitual sin, and yet they don't even realize how, how lost they are. Because uh, they're trying to deny it yourself. They're trying to hide things uh, uh, from others. But the truth of the matter is you can never hide anything from God. And so for those that come to Jesus as Savior and Lord, it's our desire that we want to, to live a life that emulates the love and grace of Jesus. You know, we want to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit. We want to have those virtues, those Christ-like virtues that demonstrate that we are different, that our lives are an open book to God. Can, can we say that, that our, our lives are truly an open book, or do we have chapters that God's not allowed to read right now? You know, are, are there things that we're trying to hide from God as if we could? Uh, you know, as we take a look at the, the beginning of this, uh, this uh, passage, it says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Certainly a precursor of this image of Jesus being lifted high on a cross 
But let me uh, give you a little bit of context on that. That's in Numbers 21. And uh, it talks about the bronze snake in, uh, beginning in verse 4. It says, Then the people of Israel sent out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey, and they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There is nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told him, Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole, and all who are bitten will live if they simply look to it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. And so it's true for those that look on Jesus as Savior and Lord. We, we're healed, body, mind, and spirit. We, we are promised eternity in heaven one day with God and our loved ones that have gone on in faith. We're promised a glorified body that's no longer prone to sin or sorrow or suffering. And so this was a, a precursor as they, they look up to this bronze uh, snake on a pole. We, we look up to a cruel cross at Calvary and we, we look into our Savior's eyes, metaphorically speaking, and we see the blood drops on his head and the spear wound in his side and the nail marks in his hands and in his feet. And we see him in his dying breath interceding on our behalf. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And there are so many people today that are lost in sin. They don't, they don't know what they're doing, and yet they're forsaking the very answer that is needed. They're forsaking the one thing that can set them free from sin and death. It's Jesus as Savior and Lord. You know, I'm convinced that there's nothing in this world that can separate us from the love of God except for one thing. Now, one thing is this, the rejection of Jesus as Savior and Lord. You know, God sees us and he loves us despite our sin. But without his son's blood covering over our sin, we are lost and without hope. We are without excuse as well. You know, if we've heard the gospel message of the need for Jesus as Savior and Lord, when we come before a holy God one day and we give an account of our lives and we must answer for our sin, we are without excuse if we have made a conscious effort to reject Jesus as Savior and Lord, and many, many do today, and I'm sure it breaks God's heart. There are people in my family and my network of church family and friends that I have been praying for for decades, literally decades. Lord, let me see before I close my eyes in death. Let me see them come to Jesus as Savior and Lord. It's, and I know that this is on God's heart and mind because we're told that when one sinner comes to Jesus as Savior and Lord, that the angels in heaven rejoice. They throw a party. This is how important it is for God to, to want this relationship with sinful mankind and all it requires is to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord and yet so many today refuse to do that. You know, from the beginning of time, you know, man has been separated from God and his love because of their love for sin. You know, the, the Bible says that men love sin more than they love God, and people lived in darkness. They didn't want to come into the light for fear that their evil deeds would be exposed. You know, I can remember growing up. I was an ornery kid. Have I ever mentioned that to you before? Yeah, I was an ornery kid. Some would say you're still the same. Uh, you haven't changed. But the reality is my, my mom and dad would let me do things, and I could make choices, but I wasn't free from the consequences of the choices that I made. You know, and, and Phyllis and I kind of adopted that type of a mindset in raising our children. You know, we would let them make mistakes as long as we knew it wasn't going to kill them, and then we would use that as a teaching opportunity. <clears throat> so I'm trying to think through this whole free will that we have that is ours in, in God to, to, to choose or to reject Christ, you know, <clears throat> just maybe God is allowing us <clears throat> to, to learn, learn the hard way sometimes, that we desperately need his love and his grace. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> you know, sin does not 
<clears throat> this is going to be one of those days. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I have a frog in my throat. Uh, sin does not stop God from loving us. You know, no matter what, there isn't anything that we can do that would cause God to love us less. There isn't anything we could do that would cause him to love us more. His love for us is perfect. Sin doesn't stop him from loving us, but sin will stop us from loving him. You know, people that are, are living in habitual sin, they will be further and further and further away from God. You know, there, there are many people in the world today that are caught up in a life that's filled with sin, and they don't even realize that they're caught up in sin because they don't know God's holy law. But there are many that have proclaimed Jesus as Savior and Lord, and little by little, they're getting further and further and further away from God. They're, they're no longer connecting with the, the, the fellowship. They're no longer reading their Bible or praying. They're no longer striving to live out a, a daily life that, uh, to try to, to be pleasing to God with the things that we say and do. And they don't realize that they are further and further along. Uh, the, re the reality is that, you know, our sins, past, present, and future, have been forgiven. On the cross of Calvary, when we made that conscious effort to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, we were forgiven. That forgiveness is complete. And it, it is a choice, though. It's a choice to love God and to continue to love God. And uh, the truth of the matter is, I've had people tell me, well, if I die with one unconfessed sin, then I'm going to go to hell. And I said, I don't think so. You know, I think a lot of people worry about this. The reality is that if we truly are in Christ and Christ is in us, we're forgiven. You know, and this is not a, you know, a name and claim it or a fire insurance type of thing. It is the realization that through this relationship that we have with God through his son, that we are redeemed, that our sins are forgiven, that we are a child of God. And, and so important. You know, Paul tells us in Ephesians but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loves us, even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So I said, God hasn't saved us because of anything that we've done or anything that we deserve, but simply because of his unmerited favor that is ours in Christ Jesus. And, and the reality is, you know, if we're in Christ, we shouldn't be living in habitual sin. If you have a sin <clears throat> that you're continuing to, to buy into and to feed into and to live into day in and day out and, and, and continuing on and on and on, that's something that you really need to, to get with God with and to pray through and to, to get out from under. But once we're truly in Christ, we are indeed saved. <clears throat> you know, John 3, 16. <clears throat> oh, my. My Fitbit says that I had about three hours worth of sleep last night. I actually went to bed at like 7.30. <clears throat> so I'm not sure what the quality of my sleep was last night. John 3.16 is probably the most memorized uh, verse of Scripture in the Bible. It's in it that we see the depth of God's love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And this eternal life is a reward for those who would believe on the name of Jesus. It's that simple. You know, we want to complicate this whole thing. We, we want to think that, well, we have to do enough good things. We have to give enough money to the church. We have to do this and we have to do that. The only thing you have to really do is you have to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord, and you have to mean it. You have to really want this relationship with God through his Son, not just a prayer, but, but a, the desire to allow Jesus to be the Savior of your life. And then you strive to, <clears throat> to live a life that emulates his love and his grace. But there isn't anything that we could do uh, that would change that. And so what a, a wonderful gift that is. I was reading about an Indian tribe where uh, one of the, the Indians had made a, a friend of uh, one of the, the white men in the community. And for whatever reason, this white man was uh, caught by this Indian tribe and was going to be put to death. And his friend laid over his body when they were going to, to uh, kill him, and his life was spared. And it, it really is a wonderful illustration of what God has done for us uh, through his son. You know, the sin that we deserve punishment for, 
the sinless Savior is the one that received this. You know, God's gracious love not only takes us out of the pit of hell, it also brings us into his presence as his children dearly loved. It is a, uh, a process, uh, but it is something that is completed when we receive Jesus, that baptism of the Holy Spirit that we have, but it's also an ongoing work of salvation that is ours that will uh, be completed fully uh, one day when we receive Jesus face to face in eternity. You know, according to John Piper, two things need to be said about this giving of God. One is that it is a giving from heaven, and the other is that it is a giving not just to come to earth, but to die. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that in order that the world might be saved through him. And so we, we see that there was a plan and there was a purpose. And it was a costly plan and purpose that not only would Jesus leave the throne room of heaven and put on flesh and dwell among us, he, he lived, he would go to the cross. We're, we're slowly but surely we are, are journeying to the cross uh, as we come to Holy Week pretty soon, and uh, that Good Friday, but also the Easter celebration when God the Father raises his son to new life. In uh, John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, you know, it, it talks uh, it, about that when it says God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but in, that in order that the world might be saved through him, a costly, costly gift to an undeserving people. And yet, that's the depth of God's love for us. You know, Jesus says, the reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, not only to take it up again, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, and I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again, this command I receive from my Father. I've been trying to wrap my mind around God's amazing love for me for, for a long, long time, and uh, I, I've always appreciated the Lenten season uh, as an opportunity to try to, to put some things aside and to pick up some more things that will help to, to draw us closer to God. But, you know, if you have the time to read through all of the gospel accounts of the passion of Jesus, uh, it's just amazing to see his depth of love for, for sinners. Um, you know, even, you know, as he would go and pray in the garden, he was praying for those that even hadn't been born yet. He was praying for you and I, and, and, and that's the depth of God's love. Even though he knew what was going to happen shortly, he was going to be arrested. He was going to be tortured. He was going to be crucified. We were still on his mind, and we, we're never far from God's mind and so, you know, I think it really is helpful for us to begin to really focus on this cross at Calvary. You know, crucifixion was one of the cruelest forms of punishment known to man at that time and may still be one of the cruelest forms of punishment. And uh, in essence, a person would tire uh, where they couldn't lift themselves up any longer and they would suffocate. They couldn't get air into their lungs. And so a lot of times they would break their legs as a way to hasten death so they, they couldn't pick themselves up anymore. But it was such a cruel form of punishment that the, the Roman government <clears throat> would not execute Roman citizens unless they did something really bad. You know, this was reserved for the outcast of society. And, and I, I just find it amazing that this was the level of punishment that God the Father would bestow on his son for sinners such as you and I. You know, the grace of Jesus Christ was sufficient and is sufficient for all of mankind. This love is perfect, and the problem is sin, and in sin, not everybody is willing to receive Jesus. You know, to look to Jesus is to look at just how much you're loved by God. You know, this is in John's first epistle. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. You know, believing, and receiving, and seeking, and searching, and striving to, to grow this relationship that is ours in Christ, to have our souls fed and nourished by God. You know, as I, I said, we can't do it an hour a week You've got to wake up every day 
with God on your mind, you know, with God in your heart, you got to start your day in prayer. You got to be intentional of living out your day and striving to be more like Jesus. I, I'm convinced we need it. Boy, do we need it now. People are just so angry and, and frustrated. And it's been a tough year. I, I get it. But you know what? The, all that anger, angriness and bitterness is not going to bring us together. But I know the one thing that can, the love of God, living in the light of God every day can bring us together. So how do we show God that we love him? Do we strive to live a perfect life? How many of you are perfect? That's evidently not a way to do it. Um, if it were possible, we really wouldn't need Jesus to die on a cross, would we? Do we have perfect attendance in church? I, I just want to preface this as your pastor, unless you're on vacation or sick, I really would like to see you in church. However, with COVID and everything, it's been a difficult environment. But even perfect attendance in church is not the assurance of eternity. Although God tells us to live in community, and it's very difficult to live in community now with masks and social distancing, but the reality is unless we have that relationship with Jesus as Savior and Lord, we're, we're lost. You can attend church every day, three times a day, and if you've never truly received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you're lost. But, you know, God's love for us is complete. He, he, he says you just have to receive it. You have to believe it, you receive it, and you begin to live out that love that is ours in Christ, and we begin to let that love overflow in the lives of others. How amazing it is to ask Jesus into your heart and life and to be able to experience this love that is ours. I, I, I don't understand. You know, I know at an early age I was able to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, and uh, and it's been years in working, trying to foster that relationship. And, and I used to buy into that. If I could just be good enough, if I could just do this or do that, that surely God would love me. And the truth of the matter is, there isn't anything I can do that would cause God to love me less. There are a lot of things I can do that would harm his heart, but it would not diminish his love for me or for anyone else for that matter. You know, Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me, and, and God has given us this precious gift. So let me ask you a question this morning. Are you in love with God? You're all going to shake your heads, yes, I know. How do you know you're in love with God? You know, what is it that, that, that helps you to know that you, you love God? And uh, for me, I think the answer is this, because when I sin, I have this still small voice of God in my ear that says what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is not right. It's not good. But I also have this, uh, the same voice of God that says, you are loved. You are a child of mine. You are dearly loved, so much so that I sent my son to die for you. And, you know, through years of prayer and the reading and studying and applying scripture and, and just striving to be more like Jesus. Not, not that it's going to earn me heaven, but it's this relationship that I'm trying to build. Boy, if we only gave our, our, our spouses the time that some people give to God, well, what a terrible relationship that would be. As a matter of fact, as I think about that, the divorce rate is about 50 or 60% uh, right now. I know it's hard to believe. And, you know, so five, five or six out of 10 are going to get divorced, generally within the first five years. Uh, although we're seeing more and more people that have been married 30 and 40 years getting divorced now. Uh, it's, it's a difficult thing. And, and uh, you know, this relationship, it, it, it takes work. You know, like I said, you know, marriage is 100%. You know, I, I've got to give 100% into loving Phyllis and to being there for her. And she's got to give 100% into loving me and being there for me each and every day, moment by moment, through the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. And that's the relationship we have to just say that, you know, I, I need God, I need Jesus, and I need him in profound ways because I want his love. I want his love to overflow from my life, and I, I want it to touch my children's life and my grandchildren's and my church children and those that I come in contact with. You know, I, I just want that love to overflow. I, I know people that are like that. Gary Carner was one. I, I don't know if he's watching by chance. He was a district manager with me at the Baltimore Sun a long, long time ago. 
And this guy just overflowed with his love for Jesus. No matter who he was talking to, he was telling them how much he loved Jesus and how much Jesus loved them. And, you know, he really got it. And he wasn't ashamed of his love for Jesus. He, he wasn't ashamed what other people thought. He just shared the, the love of Jesus wherever he went. And, and you know, I, I wanted to, to be better and better at that. You know, I, I, I do, but I still can do better. And I think we all have more room to work, right? And, uh, and I can remember, you know, Gary uh, talking about, um, you know, baptism. We were talking one day, and he said, you know, Bob, he said, a... Um, a person that is baptized, they, they're professing that their, their love for Jesus is Savior and Lord. He said, the truth of the matter is if they don't love Jesus and he's not really their Savior and Lord, they're just a wet sinner. And, and so they really haven't made a, a, a conversion. They haven't made this. And, uh, you know, someone said that many in the church today have been ironed and pressed, but few have been washed. I, I think it's just a new way of saying there's a difference between churchianity and Christianity. You know, you, you, you can say, I, I love Jesus until the cows come home, but God knows what's in your heart. And, and the only way we're going to foster that relationship and truly walk in the light is to get connected. You know, we need to be connected through the word. We need to be connected through the prayer. We need to be connected through a church. You know, find a good, you're here. So, but I'm just saying, find a good Bible-believing church that the word is being pre preached from beginning to end and, and be connected. You know, that's part of the process that we grow and we learn in community. You know, apart, we really can't do a whole lot. But when we're together, we truly grow and we can help one another in that journey of living a life that uh, I think becomes more and more pleasing to God. So unless you've been washed in the blood of Jesus... Uh, your sin is going to just keep you from loving God. Your sin is going to keep you from experiencing the love of God. And your sin is going to keep you from loving others. Well, I want to wrap this up. Um, for God so loved you and I. For God so loved us that he gave his one and only son that in believing we might have life, the life that God desires for us in Jesus you know, we have eternal life because Christ Jesus died in our place. I can't even begin to imagine that collectively that he died for mankind. And yet when we come to Good Friday and we look at that, the cross and the, the weight of everything that's on him, that three hours where God the Father even turned his back on him because he carried the weight of our sin to demonstrate his love to set us free. What a, an amazing love that is. So we should strive every day to live in the light. Let us pray. Father God, we come together today and we, uh, we thank you for Jesus as Savior. And Lord, we, we thank you, Father, that you are patient with us. That you're slow to anger, that you're quick to forgive, that you're abounding in love. And that you want to foster a relationship with us that is good and pleasing. One that allows your light to shine brightly in our lives and overflow in love for you and for one another. And so, Father, continue that work that has once begun in Christ that will be carried on to eternity and perfected one day. I just thank you, Father, for those that have received the, the joy in knowing Jesus as Savior and Lord. And I pray, Father, if there's anybody here today or anybody listening or watching that doesn't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, that today would be the day that they would surrender their lives to his care, that they would seek forgiveness of sin, that they would invite Jesus to be the Savior of their lives to the rejoicing of the angels in heaven. And so we just thank you, Father, for first loving us. Help us to love you more. For these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our uh, closing hymn today is How Great Thou Art. I'm sorry. It's a God thing. It's got to be. <laughs> Wonderful. How Great Thou Art is one of my favorites as well. Thank you, Robin. Please stand and join me. Oh, Lord, my God, when I am awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. 
I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not spare Sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and then they proclaim, My God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. How great thou art, how great thou art. It was nice, but I really miss Carol. But th there's a part of me, though, because Carol's just as ornery as I am, <laughs> that maybe she speeded this up on purpose. I don't know. So anyway, uh, you can let her know that she was missed today, and we look forward to, to having her and Glenn back next week. Go out into the world this week, live in the light of God's love, and share that love with those that you meet. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen and amen.